This is Podkit, episode 59, Soon to Soonish, on August 2nd, 2020. And now, I was barely a child at the time. This episode of Podkit is hosted by Brandon Bread underscore MN, Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersad. This episode has show notes at thenexus.tv slash PK59. Are we ready to go? Let's I'm, do this. I'm, I'm ready. Cool. As usual, we don't have any follow-up. That's great. <laughs> As usual. It's much easier to not have follow-up when you also don't have episodes. <laughs> it's only been two months. I think or, we're just going now. So. Or an audience. Wow. <laughs> Welcome to podcast. Hey, That's everybody. the first way to win. That's the first way to win. With with no with no followers. If you're all followees, then it works. Well um, done. That, that word still is, yeah. We made that up. We totally did. It's I get the red squiggle underline. Actually, it's blue right now in Google Docs. It should just learn it. Right click. Uh, consider feedback on suggestion. If I give GTP3 all of the show notes, will it just produce all of the shows now? <laughs> View Oof. personal dictionary. Wow. It is so deep. I, it's like six menus in. The, <laughs> apparently, the other personal dictionary words in here are Mac OS and PodKit. Perfect. Those are the only good ones. Oh, uh, right. You have, to, you have to teach Google Docs Mac OS. Sure. Sounds about right. <laughs> I bet it knows I bet it knows Chrome OS just fine. <laughs> I bet it knows G Drive. Right. Gosh. I, you know what? You know what? I bet it might even know Google Reader. Google Plus. <laughs> no, no. That one's, that one's, um, that's a, that's a red word for sure. <laughs> Right up there with Wave. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, we're, we, it's only been two months, which is, you know, Ooh. worse than a lot of the time, but not as bad as it sometimes is. Yeah, there was one time where we joked we were becoming quarterly, like a quarterly podcast, right? <laughs> yeah, 2018, 19, yeah. maybe? I don't know. We've been, like, well, pretty good this year. Yeah, exactly. I think we're, like, mostly monthly, but not quite until until now, but, you know. And then June happened. June well, and July. Oof. <laughs> Why is it August yes. already? I don't know. This year. Well, let's see. Uh, what happened since June, early June? Um, <laughs> Some kind of conference. Yeah, but, you know, they couldn't be in person, so they had to do something a little differently, didn't they? Yeah, they did. And maybe it was almost better that they did. Yeah. I mean, that's so. basically how I always experience this conference, which is WWDC. And by experience, it is I just watch the keynote and I read Twitter. And it was actually kind of easier to watch it and just tweet live because it was just all pre recorded. Yeah. And I think from like clips and snippets of all these session videos that I didn't watch any of them, uh, or the actual videos, because I'm not an Apple developer, I just develop on Apple. Um, there is a lot more personality and character that came out of all these videos because they're pre-produced that they can like put a little more work into. I think there's always the, you, you have higher standards when you're presenting in front of people that's being recorded live, like single take. Yeah. Um, so I think that kind of changes the atmosphere. And so people had a little more fun with it. There was like weird trinkets on the tables next to their computers or whatever. And there are weird jokes and, and examples and stuff. And that was just seemed kind of cool. How many takes do you think Craig needed to make all of his good jokes? I yeah, I don't know. And but like then you had things like uh the other executive in like their workout room mm-hmm. talking about Apple Watch and stuff like that kind of stuff you just wouldn't really be able to do. Though they did demo the Apple Watch with cellular uh when a woman was like standing on a paddle board in the middle of the San Francisco Bay. So they have done weird remote things in the past. But and then, and then they sank, and we never heard from them again. Yeah, uh, yeah, they they were they were taken out by the trained Coast Guard sharks. So, do you, do, you, do you did you like overall the whole live thing or the whole pre recorded thing? I really like the pre record. I hope they do that again next year. Yeah, I liked it too. Um, All signs point to the fact that this pandemic will still be with us next WWDC. Oh so. no, <laughs> uh, a non-zero it, possibility. It'll be yeah. March when. 2021 begins Oof, still march forever i feel like the the keynote at least went by like they put a lot more content in 
too, because they never had to wait for the audience and right. transitions and stuff. It was it was a much more rapid pace, which is which is nice. I liked it. Now, on the other hand, I think the the whole the whole idea of the keynote in this particular keynote, and we're going to talk about this in a moment. Uh, there was only really to me one new part. All of the other stuff about like, ooh, look, new buttons in iOS, great, how exciting. Of course, there are going to be new buttons. Like that stuff isn't super interesting to me, um, and so I always think of it as it's uh, new features for the sake of filler time in the marketing material that the keynote is. Uh, so, you know, it's fine that they had more time to play with, but I also I don't know if it mattered because it would have been either filler that was shorter or filler that was longer. You know, it's it's also kind of interesting that they were freed from the tyranny of applause, right? Like they didn't really need to perform this for anybody. Because, you know, I mean, they did, but they didn't, right? They performed it for the camera. And, you know, that, that like you said, change, changes a little bit of, like, the kind of jokes or setup that they were able to do. Because it's it's able to be a lot more intricate as a result. Do you think um, Phil and Tim and, like, the rest of the exec team all had their big Twitter dashboards open and were just watching the tweets come through? Do you ever, yes, do you ever see, um, there's an episode of The West Wing where uh, they demo this polling technique, which is really interesting because it's it's uh, it's not necessarily common, but there's a particular Republican strategist who uses this all the time. Uh, and hilariously, he was a consultant on that show where basically um, people are given dials, right? And they're supposed to dial, turn the dial in one direction or the other direction to indicate whether they liked or disliked what the... Um, uh, what they were saying. And it's really funny because like Twitter lets us all basically do that and would certainly let them do that. Yes. I think they absolutely had something like that because that's been, that's been around for like 40 odd years. And it's, it's like, especially for very metrics oriented people. Um, and I'd have to imagine with the, you know, how impeccably WWDC needed to be choreographed that they're thinking about, oh, yeah, we need to know exactly how these jokes <laughs> land, right? And, you know, the jokes paired with the decisions, right? <laughs> so, I don't know. Air Force One. stuff. Yeah, Air Force <laughs> One. Well, right, the, what do they call it? Their crack team of marketing, oh, yeah, product marketing professionals. That, that, who name the, that's been going on for like 10 years now, and it's hilarious still. Yep, yeah. it's... Yeah. Yeah, somehow, much like Craig's hair, it's still not stale. <laughs> so the other big thing that actually came out of WWDC um, was uh, Apple Silicon. What do you guys think about that? I mean, Intel's kind of been dropping the ball a little bit last, you know, many years and in years of the future. I think they're, the next generation is, or uh, what's their seven nanometer shrink is now being delayed till end of 2023. Mm-hmm. That came out this week, so... Yeah, it seems like uh, a good time to to distance, and I think the Apple Silicon chips are going to be much higher performing and with better power consumption. Maybe I don't know. I think it'd be good. Apple does ch- uh, instruction set transitions pretty well. Uh, I don't know. It's, yeah. it's, it's a core competency now, practically, right? <laughs> you know, when your when your software business has a core competency of changing architecture, you know that there's something kind of weird about that. But okay. I think the phrase is nimble, dare I say, agile. Wait, wait, what, what was that? Brave or courageous? I mean, courage. Hmm. Yeah, courageous. Yeah, that's a good. That's the, that has a nice ring to it too. Yeah. But no, you're abs- you're absolutely right. I mean, there's the Motorola to PowerPC transition, PowerPC to Intel, and now you know we've just got another one. Um, but you you have to imagine like it's not exceedingly likely, assuming this goes well, that there's going to be another one because why would you know, the most valuable company in the world ever spin anything out, right? Well, I can like, actually think, no, I can no think point. of one that was also oh, yeah. simultaneously brewing. Well, apparently ARM is being destroyed by being purchased, which is beautiful. By whom? Possibly NVIDIA. Oh. Oh. Now, that doesn't matter Uh-oh. so much for Apple because Apple has their perpetual license, but, you know, hypothetically... It could matter, I suppose. There's mainline arm, and then there's Apple arm, strong arm. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, yeah, that's that's the other thing. Apple could strong arm Nvidia into into you know doing some stuff, or like like Brian said, they could just keep doing what they're doing indefinitely and say this was helpful to us at one point, and now we're so far removed from it that we'll just hire you know 
everyone who doesn't work at NVIDIA, you know, who has these skills to to continue maintain it as our own thing. Right. Because we have this perpetual license. You can't sue us, you know, yada, yada, yada. Um, so I kind of wonder, I like I wasn't in, I wasn't an engineer. I wasn't anything. I was barely a child at the time. But, you know, it, during that Motorola time window, when there were very variant, many variants of CPU in the world, um, like there was this kind of worldwide collusion onto sort of a, a finite set of architectures and chip types. Like, do we see that sort of ending sometime here in the future where there's going to be more chip types and architectures? I wouldn't be surprised if more and more moves towards ARM. I think Apple going first is kind of the the first jump that the industry needs to see. Um, Microsoft does have Windows running on ARM. Now it, it's locked to OEM only at the moment. But I think if that opens up a little bit more and people start moving towards it, Linux has worked on ARM for quite a while now. So if servers keep you know using it more, I think ARM could definitely be the next big instruction set x86 has been around for a very long time and it has a lot of legacy stuff in there and it's you know it's an old complicated feature set so i think yeah i mean it, it can't last forever it's things are going to change eventually over time and as you uh ryan i think you said a few minutes ago you're like well what's what's next and i mean in 2005 we intel was is the next thing what 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 could possibly be better than intel then so we, we just don't know well, I mean, back then AMD could have been better, but that was an oops. But they they had the same they had the same they both used uh, uh, AMD sixty four. Sure. So I mean that that's they still had the same instruction set, just different. I mean, some small things on top, but more or less the same Intel between AMD at that time. Yeah. So the, the reason I ask is I I just wonder. You know, it's interesting today. I feel like we're not really reluctant at all to say. Yeah, sure. Give us new architectures. Give us new chip types. It doesn't matter. We'll compile for it. I feel like back then, though, there was much more um, concern that that would have caused too much fragmentation and there was just too much difficulty to service all of those different types. And and now I feel like it's almost a non-issue. Yeah, I guess like the the big like vacant space that I don't know that I have an answer for because this is my expertise, I guess, is um, you know, all of all of the architectures I can currently think of, right, um, exist in in such a form that like there are compilers for them already, mm-hmm. right? Like, um, I mean, sure. I guess I guess maybe the 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 most indicative thing is like there are separate like ARM architectures. There's that like HF, you know, one that. You know, ARM HF is the one that's used in Raspberry Pis and stuff like that. And then there's V7, um, which is used, I don't know, elsewhere. Probably 7S, 64, 7S. 64E. There are a few different, yeah, there are several different variations. So I, I guess I guess maybe that's the maybe that's maybe that's all the indication I need, right? Is that it's not really all that difficult, um, assuming you have an instruction set to write, you know, presumably a compiler backend for it, mm-hmm. right? Like what, like what, what other infrastructure do you need other than like, you know, playing an LLVM and, you know, you, 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 everyone has compiler front ends that talk to LLVM. And so if you can take it from there, you're, maybe right. you're good to go. So once, I don't know. once it gets it, everybody gets it. So that's good. Yeah. Well, I'm also thinking about sort of like the ecosystem today, like we have better internet, so it's not a big deal if we have to, you know, distribute a dozen different binaries. Nobody will really notice or care. We have better storage than we've ever had. We've, we have pretty much everything is better now. Yeah. I guess there's no reason. There's no reason we couldn't Uh, The only reason is our lack of imagination, which is the only thing that limits a lot of things. So now what's going to happen is we're going to get HP Silicon and compact Silicon and Lenovo Silicon. And, um, I don't even know who else makes computers anymore. Silicon But under the hood. It's all ARM. It's just ARM doesn't have the 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 public facing name anymore. Well, I don't know. Like maybe maybe like FireWire and IE three uh thirteen ninety four, right? Yeah, kind the, of. The but on the other hand, what happens? You know, I don't know how how I don't know what deviations Apple has in their chips, but you know, eventually something will one minor stupid thing 
the bit flips here and not there. And now we have to have different binaries anyway, not only on top of, obviously it's a different operating system architecture, but also a different internal shape. Right. Mm, Could be dangerous. Watch out. Could be. Okay. But here's the real question. What computers are we going to get here? I think there's going to be Mac mini Mac mini pretty soon. That's what they already, I mean, that's what they already have, right? They already have the Mac Mini. That's what they're sending out for the dev kits um, for this new CPU architecture. I think that's going to be a pretty pretty big given. Um, aside from that, I don't really know. I mean, eventually they're going to be rolling it out to other things, but um, I, I, I'm hesitant. I have to wonder who's a customer for whom Apple Silicon is going to be a banner feature right now. And I feel like that answer is probably mostly people like me and maybe people like us, right? Um, early adopters and probably developers, frankly. Um, uh, or, you know, like, for example, um, I've never owned a Mac Mini, um, but it, a Mac Mini is looking like my best, you know, value Mac purchase in the next however many years, Um and I feel like there are a lot of people who are kind of in that same boat, mm-hmm. um, a Mac mini or an iMac or something like that that can be used for professional purposes. So people who know enough to, to be enticed by Apple Silicon or at least intrigued in what, what the differences might be. I would say most people buy a MacBook of some sort, though. And if you switch to Apple Silicon and your battery life is doubled, that alone is to be like, ooh, I kind of need a new Mac. My battery's dying. The new one literally has double the amount of battery than mine my current bad one did when I bought it new. Like, I think that's a huge, a huge win. I wonder if in a perfect year, if 2020 hadn't been so chaotic for the supply chain in Apple and just everybody in general, uh, I wonder if they would have tried to um, revive the the MacBook One or the MacBook Adorable or whatever it's called, uh, because that seems like the perfect computer for the doubling of your battery life and for... If you aim that right in September, you know, back to school season, like that would have been a perfect time. They're going to release something with touch support. Like it's it's bound to happen. Big Sur is such a that everything is bigger and more stretched out. I think it's bound to happen. Maybe not immediately, but in the next year or two, I wouldn't be surprised. I don't know. Well, and all of the the cross app compatibility between iOS and macOS now. That's yeah, if you can run good. iOS on macOS, having some touch support would be nice. So yeah. are you going to download the Slack? Uh, iOS app, or are you going to download the Electron app? iOS, absolutely <laughs> iOS. Except for except for the formatting part. The formatting part is what would mess with me every time because they've not only has Slack totally messed up formatting, it's gonna it's even worse on iOS. Um, I would totally buy a, a MacBook with ARM. Just if you know the the rumors are today that it'll be sub a thousand dollars, and that's. That's phone territory. That's no. That's not a big deal. I've been waiting for an iMac, as as you all probably know, for the last couple of years now. And I've been waiting for like a case redesign. Rumors are that a new version's coming out later this month, but it will likely be Intel still. Um, I've seen like renderings of that new iMac that look like a a mounted um, iPad, and it looks super cool. But I don't know if I believe that. Yeah. So that's what I'm waiting for. Um, I would love to have uh, an. A Mac desktop with a display built in. I'm waiting for that. Um, I will probably wait for ARM no matter what I do, though. So if it's Intel, I'll wait another refresh for maybe next year. Who knows? Yeah, don't you feel like a lot of people are going to do that at this point? If they know what's going on, if they're your average consumer, probably not. Do average consumers even use computers? Or if you're, or if you're a developer and you want, or you, you, you do a lot of stuff with Intel or something. Things. I think, like, you know, virtualization and stuff i mean that abstracts some of it out but still i don't know i think keeping it on intel for a little while for a lot of professionals is you know your your average professional who doesn't want to be a uh early adopter or trendsetter within their organization i think yeah to me it always seems like the macbook the 16 inch macbook pro would be last or maybe not last maybe that's the mac pro but among the among the MacBook Pro, the iMac Pro, and the Mac uh, the Mac Pro, like those feel like the last three, just because they need to be the most powerful and compute capable. What do you think about um, not including uh, third party graphics? 
iOS has been fine with that. I think their graphics are pretty good. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think if Apple can own the graphics as well, that's probably bringing a lot of power efficiency stuff. I'm sorry, there's a helicopter hovering over Uptown right now. I don't know if you can hear it. I hear nothing, but you know mm-hmm. they they're out there. They do that a lot. I've I've heard uh, I've heard tell of the helicopters. Now, do you think the helicopter has an NVIDIA chip or an AMD chip? Pro- uh, more likely to be NVIDIA, I would imagine. NVIDIA's got all that self-driving car hardware mm-hmm. stuff, right? Yeah, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, it, it already knows what to do with lasers. <laughs> Honestly, my NVIDIA news is from our friend Ian Buck. His Google News alert tweets that say, famous Ian Bucks, because <laughs> one of their VPs at NVIDIA is named Ian Buck. Yep. That's where I see half my NVIDIA news. That's, so. that's pretty mm-hmm. much all news, really. Yeah, that's all you need. Yeah, every once in a while I think about doing that for me, but um, uh, if you do it for Brandon Johnson, it's actually spammier than my Twitter feed. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's fair. Yeah, well, I'm I'm really excited. I I I when when do you guys think the first one will come out here? I'm I'm not not super uh, likely that it's September. Maybe like right before Black Friday that doesn't exist this year. Sure. Uh, I say soon to soonish. So, uh, yeah, probably in the next couple months, September maybe. But I would also see November or like December, and they're barely sh- shipping it by the end of the year. Yeah, like their their usual, you know, we'll ship it by the end of the year. Okay, that means December twenty ninth. Right, and so if I feel like if they do that though, everybody will think, wow, that means the yields weren't good, and now it's not not a safe buy. I don't know. We'll see. We'll we'll probably record at least two more episodes before <laughs> before the end of the year. Yeah, you know? we'll have to see for sure. And then we'll record our first episode on what, and that'll be fun. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Right. Full disclosure: I'm recording this on a XPS 13. Uh, p- possibly the first uh, podcast episode recorded not on a Mac in a uh, very long time. And then, and then, what what Brian will do here at this very moment in the um, editing of the post production is he will insert a blue screen noise right there. What does a blue screen sound like? <sighs> first <laughs> and <laughs> second. Um, Brian doesn't edit the podcast. Right. Nobody we, no, edits the podcast. No, nobody, nobody no edits the show, post right? Post-production. The podcast edits itself, frankly. I just somehow stare at Logic Pro for an hour and a half Watching every time it. I record for some reason. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. Um, let's talk about something that isn't Apple-related, the other half of this um, series. Uh, something about JavaScript. Brian, tell us about nice. JavaScript. So it was uh, made by this guy named... Uh, I don't even know his name. Brendan. Um, is it Brandon? Brandon. It, 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 it could Brandon? be. It could be Brandon Johnson. It, <laughs> it could be. There's a possibility, but there's. You know, I've found other people named Brandon Johnson who were web developers. It turns out they're. It's not that uncommon of a name, but no, I think you're thinking of Tanner Lindsley. Well, uh, yes, uh, he didn't. He didn't write JavaScript, but um, uh, he wrote uh, React Query, which is something I think we've been using a little bit more lately. I finished up some refactoring at work that pulls it in for a large amount of our application. Um, some had used it already, and now even more does. And so, so it's been kind of fun. Tell us what it is, because I, I don't think a lot of people know anything at all about what React Query does. Since the word React is in it, like, did the React team make it? Like, how does that work? It is a open source library that is written by uh, someone not on the React core team. Um, it is built for React. However, it's like core query kind of implementation is agnostic for whichever library you want to build on. I think they're talking about some integrations with Svelte or Vue. I don't quite remember. So like in the, in the core, it's called React Query, but there's a core and a React kind of root directory where each are implemented. So it's a, a library for man, managing, I guess, server state in your UI. Um, so it's at its like most basic form is like a async fetch hook for your components, right? So you can, you know, instead of saying window.fetch dot then handle it dot error or dot catch show error state, you know, that kind of stuff. It so it does that. It has stuff around if the components mounted so you're not updating state when it unmounts. But it also saves the result into a query cache. And so you can 
um, specify stale time and cache time for each of your queries. Um, and your query keys are can be dynamically updated based on parameters towards each request. And there are other cool things like you can have it um, refetch on an interval, um, some pagination or like, you know, kind of infinite scrolling. Yeah. Infinite scrolling, but no, the uh, use, use, use paginated query. Tanner called it something that was good. Um, it was kind of, uh, I don't quite remember the phrase, but it was kind of like a lazy, you know, it, the old, the old data stays around while the new next data is being fetched sure. basically. And then I think also out of the box, it will automatically refetch when you, um, lose a comeback to a window focus. So yep. visibility change is pretty cool. Yep, exactly. So it's, it's all about, um, keeping your data up to date and, um, you can use it in component state, despite the fact that that, that component may not be mounted all the time yet, the cache will stay around. And so you can, um, I think out, out of the box configuration is you click around your app, the previously fetched data will be loaded first. And then in the background, it will update to get the latest data. Now in like a kind of a, a rest application that has both displaying and updating of data, you can use it, the use mutation hook where you can invalidate queries that are related to that. Um, you can also, so say you're, you have a list of items and you have an endpoint or a, a hook query hook that you want to, to update and add like a new item to that list. So you could post that request up to your, your data layer and then get the list later once it succeeds with updating it. And then you can maybe do the get later, but that takes a little more time. You can also then update the local cache version through mutation. So you can add it both to the request going out to your data layer, but you can also at the same time, add it to the list of the cached items on your UI. So you can kind of do it at the same time. So it's instant. And in the background, it's actually sending it to your API. Mm -hmm. So there are a bunch of features around kind of state management from the you know server state and pulling it into your UI. Um, so I've I've been doing very basic features. We're we're implementing just a blanket five minute cache in our UI, so we're not refetching things as you're moving around the app. We're using the cache version until it expires, and then it will fetch the new one the next time its uh, component is mounted. So it works pretty well for that as well, um, and it's really easy to configure and change that cache if we ever want to. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think Ryan, you've looked into it a little bit. Yeah, so you know my my journey with the the Tan Stack, as it's called these days. Um, oh yeah. So Tanner is the guy who made it, and uh, he's made some other utilities or tools or packages as well, like uh, for example React Table. Oh yes. Uh, and uh, React Table was actually my first exposure to Tanner, and um, actually we used it on a project at work, and it was su super cool. It it gave a lot of flexibility to, um, you know, loading large sets of data. Um, you know, this was like um, kind of like a trading app, and so you can imagine hundreds or thousands of rows, and uh, loading all of that into memory isn't a great thing. So React Table really helped with that, and we also needed uh, extensive searching and paging and sorting and blah blah blah. Um, one of the chilling effects though, from a few months ago, um, was all of this integrated spyware stuff. And so like all of that's gone now and it's wonderful. And, um, because of that, uh, I've actually recently, t uh, started using React Query as well, um, and, and continue to promote React Table. And so the, some of the novel stuff with, um, React Query that I'm doing is I'm actually using it to interface with my API and my local storage state in the same identical way. And that seems kind of weird because uh, local storage is effectively synchronous, but having the ability to detect errors, like, hey, is the data in local storage there? Cool, that means data comes back in the data prop, no big deal. But if the data is not there, or if it's malformed, or if it's expired because its internal timestamp is too old, then I can go do different stuff. And I think that's a super effective way of kind of providing this uniform layer of data that the component or the user didn't generate right now. I really like that. I think that's super cool. So are you syncing the, the query cache to local storage? No, at this time or I'm not. Is it more of a... 
local storage check then if not there go to the api yeah it's kind of like that local cache yep or okay. or it's just um like we have this kind of big wizard workflow and instead of persisting that globally like in a single state store like redux or even a, like a gigantic context you know so it can survive through refreshes and stuff um and just you know be available offline we do ha- we have this local storage kind of wizard and there's a bunch of different local storage items that get populated and we just ha- it's just great to have the same uniform interface to get all of that data in and out so that's been really slick nice but uh, i've also was looking at some of the v3 umbrella issues and um for react query one of the things is actually planned and i talked to brian about this independently having not known about it but they actually plan on having the an ability to mirror uh, the query cache and all of its goodness to whatever storage provider is available. So if you're a React native user, you might want to just pump it all out to async storage. So that'd be pretty fun. Or if you're brave and you like uh, local local storage on the browser, you could pump it all out there too. So I think there's a lot of um, quality of life there. I think there's a lot of stuff that, that really helps because it, it survives uh, refresh. And I think for me... That's been one of the most appealing features that people really like. Yeah, I, I definitely think like a storage adapter yeah. uh, makes sense for a library like this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, you can use local storage, session storage, but maybe even like index DB right. or exactly. you know, something else. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think React Query has been really fun. Um, I'm really glad that I get to use it now without like any any barriers um, on, the, on data collection and stuff. Um, the API has been pretty good. Um, there's been a few weird things with the docs where you think this one obvious thing should be obvious and you just cannot find like a discrete list of like API values and API inputs and outputs. Like it's all written words and it's not a lot of it is written in like pure API docs. Yeah. I think, I think that will get better with, um, it's recently been converted to TypeScript, Mm -hmm. um, by another, person uh other than tanner and i think that will help with generating types that are 100 percent reflective of the library the current typescript types are kind of manually managed based on the implementation in javascript yep. and so you have the docs the types and the and the source that are all having to be kept in sync and that there i've noticed some discrepancies there too um so i think you know unifying that to only having you know two variations or even one if you're doing auto generating api docs i think that'll i think you know, that's a solvable thing um, that will be improved over time. So, Brandon, what do, you, what do you think about React Query? Yeah, so I've never actually used React Query, but I use something similar to it called uh, SWR, uh, which stands for State While Revalidate. But, I mean, so I was scrolling through the docs a little bit, um, particularly for reasons we'll get into uh, in just a second. Um, but really, they seem to be solving a lot of the same problems. Basically, you can, you can pass uh, SWR an arbitrary fetch like promise and it will keep it quote unquote synchronized based on you know configuration options you give it um so it has all all as far as i can tell a lot of the same features in terms of you know um if somebody changes tabs and goes back you know when the windows in focus it'll it'll refetch or at least revalidate um and it'll also you know re pull on intervals and you know do all sorts of fun stuff like that now, the thing that I'm really interested in and the thing that I um, wanted to look up while we were um, on, on, the, on, the, on the show here was um, how it handles pagination. Because pagination is actually a really, um, I, I think it's a really difficult problem to solve. And I, I had recently found SWR's pagination support, even though it was like kind of, you know, listed as a banner feature, I found it to be somewhat um, lacking in description and, um, and also in functionality because a lot of the places where I need to do pagination, right. Is places where you have both paginated data, right. So you have an offset of, you know, how many records you've already got and a limit for how many articles you want per page. Mm -hmm. But you also have a filter. You also have a filter parameter, the filter parameter, you know, your API, Usually, at, this is this is at least an architecture that I found to be common, and but you know maybe there's a different way to do this, which is part of why I want to talk through it. Um, that filter parameter might do all sorts of magic on your backend, right? It'll it'll say like, oh well, you know, 
Um, for 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 this query, right? Especially if you're using something like GraphQL, but you know, not necessarily it could be anything, right? Um, for this query, this wants to, I just basically want to do a clear text search on all of my string fields, which are enumerated here, here, and here, yep. right? And it'll do an I, as you know, a, a Postgres I like, a SQL I like, uh, case insensitive comparison across all those, and then say, oh great, I found everything where the name, email, um, type, and status were one of these values, and then just and them all together, and then I have, you know, there's my list. Um, now the SWR pagination system didn't really have a good way to do this without evicting everything from your cache. Um, it's possible this has changed since then. Hi, quick pause from Brian while editing this. Uh, I don't edit the show. What are you talking about? Uh, SWR has been updated since um, recording, and I think the version that Brandon used, so just keep that in mind. Um, it's more of a historical look at comparing how SWR handled things compared to today's React query. Sure, so you couldn't reuse old items. So you couldn't reuse old items, and uh, the paginated query hook wouldn't actually... So paginated query, i that's the React query, query terminology, but uh, use SWR pages, I think is the name of the, of the hook in SWR. It wouldn't actually even notice something had changed if you changed the key because the filter was part of the key, mm. it would, it would just, and that, that blew my mind. Cause that like breaks my entire concept of how this works. Right. Um, and to this day, I don't know why it didn't work that way, but basically one of the things that I was curious about is whether this example incorporated filtering as well. It doesn't look like it does. What do you mean by filtering was part of the key? So it didn't even look at it. What do you mean by that? And that's to be our, so, I'll see if I can map this closely to what's happening here. So, for example, I'm looking at the use paginated query docs right now, and I can see there's a, a first parameter use paginated queries an array that says projects, and then um, the page number is passed in, basically, right? Mm -hmm. So, my understanding is this argument, it would be pretty similar to what it means uh, in SWR terms, which is ostensibly whenever this, uh, th this is like a hook, a handle, a ref a reference to um, this particular query, right? And if for whatever reason that query is different, for example, if the page number is incre incremented or in my case, if the filter is changed, I would envision that it should be treated like an entirely separate request, right? An entirely separate query and it should refetch everything and, and, and start from scratch. But that wasn't what was happening. Now, I was, I was kind of in the midst of a lot of stuff then, so I don't know you know, it's possible it's changed a lot. It's possible, you know, there are some like patchy spots in my knowledge of how this works. But to, to my knowledge, they were actually just rewriting the SWR pagination API um, <laughs> while that was happening. And I think they just, they somewhat recently released a new version that had a next generation pagination API that I believe looked much closer to this. Yeah, so I can I can explain how this works a little bit. So the use query and use paginated query are very similar. The only difference is use paginated query has a, additional resolved data property on the response. Hmm. So with a normal query, you you get your data in data. So it um, it starts as undefined, then it fetches it. Um, when the status is successful, then it then data is the response of that you know fetch function or whatever function that returns a promise that you pass in. Use paginated query has that data, but it also has a resolved data, which is the the last resolved data from any key within that hook that was resolved. And it stays around even if that key has, even if the query key has changed, uh, such as like you go to the next page or you change a filter, resolve data will still have the last loaded data. So it means you can like click next page and your, your, your table of data isn't going to flash to a loading state and then flash in with data. It keeps the existing data there until the next resolved data comes back and then it shows that. So that's really the only difference with paging a query. And then when building a query or the only difference from page into query and use query, from what I would remember at least. Now, that means that array that you see in the example here of it's an array with two two arguments or two two items. The first is a string projects, and the second is um, a page variable, which I'm assuming is it's a number. Yep. Um, so that means that the key is literally project zero, projects one, projects two. Um, you can pass in objects, you can pass in any number of things. It you know, basically serializes it, and then that is the key. So if anything in that ar array changes, it's a new key, and it's going to refetch it. 
But right. if it's within the context of that use paginated query hook, it will keep the previously resolved data as the response there. Yep. And I think that makes a lot of sense. What happens if you had a, 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 a like, instead of page being a number, what if that was an object and you had, like, page inside of it and then, like, filter string? Um, it runs basically json.stringify on every render, and it compares the current key versus the previous key, and if it's any different, then it will refetch. So that's yeah. how it works for me. We have, like, something like 15 parameters for most of our endpoints. Um, because of how we've implemented global filters and that kind of stuff. And so we have, you know, we're formatting dates to a string because we don't want to depend on, you know, JavaScript date serialization. But yeah, you know, we're we're running based on some of our stuff. We're doing, we have a huge, a huge block of stuff that we're just passing in as a JavaScript object. And then we're letting React Query uh, do the serialization to its internal key state. I don't know, it works really well. We've kind of disabled the stale while refetch um, as to to not show... So our stale time and our cache time are both five minutes, meaning uh, if it's stale, it will show stale and it won't refetch. Um, at least for, for my app, we think that that kind of a pattern isn't common. You know, I don't think I've really seen anything in the company too much showing that, at least in the analytics space. So um, there's some uh, worry about if, if data were changing, you know, flashing to different stuff once the page had loaded, that there'd be confusion around that. Um, now we, we have like an even longer than five minute cache time in Redis behind the scenes. So it's, it's like, it's not super common, but those edge cases are there where you load, you load one page, you know, you're clicking around pretty quick and then you've, the cache in the back end has expired and it's going to actually refetch new data. And then you're going to go back to the page in the UI and then things might flash a little more. I don't know. It's, you know, we'll, we'll get there. I think there's there's chances, especially with um, there's some features in React Query around is any is any query right now refetching anything at all right now? So you can do like a global is fetching kind of check. Sure. So you can do a thing like show a, a spinner in the corner of your application if anything is updating. Yeah, or like one of those uh, infinitely loading bars. I was, I was going to say you do a takeover. You have to do a takeover. That's the only way you can't trust anything if it's loading, right? <laughs> Yeah, so you can you can implement something on there, and that might be a way of of moving trust towards something like that. I'm I'm really excited to try it out. I think that I think that model of pagination, especially with regard to you know like what happens if you need to change more than just the page number, I think um, that that makes a lot more sense than um, what I've run into with SWR. And it works really well with React Table as well. Um, Imagine that React Table is um, it. In some cases, so we have like uh, a row that you can expand to show additional rows within a row. Mm. And the way we've implemented that is sometimes we'll re-render it twice with base- with the same state that would go to the request, but the table has updated something else maybe. So um, using the React query cache and stuff, we can utilize that to protect us against multiple fetches because the query key is the same, so it's not going to refetch and our our cache time is f- five minutes in this case, so it's not going to, you know, it's gonna it's gonna stay from the cache and not actually go out and make a network request when it re-renders, you know, twice within half a second or something. Makes sense. Yeah, I've I've really enjoyed using this so far. Um, one of the weird side effects of having done this in sort of a uh, workflow user workflow driven application instead of something more static, like you know, look at a dashboard kind of thing. Uh, is that I have added, <laughs> not maybe intentionally, but I have added much more exposure to the the true latency of fetching data just in general from the server. Whereas before I would just have one loading state maybe, but now I have loading and is fetching all the time. And I don't know, maybe users will like it or maybe they'll hate it. We'll just find out. What do you mean loading and is fetching all the time? So I, um, you know, it's user workflow driven. So like you're not on a page for very long, but in the previous versions of this thing, I would just kind of show a loading state on a very um, infrequent basis because like you change a page and now it just loads once and you're good to go. But now, you know, the, the stale or the cache expiry will cause something to show a loading thing initially for a little bit. And it's just a little bit different than how I was doing it before. It's pretty fun. I'm a pretty big fan already, and I used it for a week. Yeah. I mean, aside from my uh, complaints about pagination, I think I I liked SWR a lot too. Um, But I think I'm definitely going to reach for React Query next time, just based on 
you know, I know you guys mentioned there's some docs issues from time to time, but I mean, any project has docs issues. So. Well, and I ended up reading the source code directly and the, the reading the source code was fine. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, with that, you know, that's that's the other half of the battle. So excited to check it out. Yeah, I'm sure we'll be talking more about this over time, too. Many, many times. In, in work, we I've, I've kind of pushed to use React Query for all of our component state or all of our component fetching, which we moved off of Redux basically as soon as hooks came out and it became a lot easier to do to share that kind of logic. Um, we used another library called React Request Hook, which directly consumes from an Axios instance that's in a context. It's a way, way smaller library. Um, but it works pretty similar to how React Query works for us, except it doesn't have a cache at all. So it's... It's just always hitting. It's a way smaller subset of features. Yeah. It's an async thing built around hooks and Axios. But we still have a bunch of Redux global state that uh, some of it especially could be moved to React Query and, you know, like user settings that um, we don't really need to change unless they change it. At least that's how we're treating it today. So we could, you know, store that in React Query and set the query cache time to be like an hour, you know, something way higher and then just never worry about refetching and just use that as our, you know, it would almost be a drop in replacement for existing Redux selector hooks. Um, we could probably do that and not even have to touch any of the components that are consuming from it. Well, as long as in our test that we preload the cache with something so it doesn't actually make a network request, but yeah. So I was just remembering one of the other pain points I had with SWR and it was around like whether or not, uh, or whether there's any need to optimistically update the cache uh, with the result of a change because you might not refetch it for a little while. You can do that if you want to. And is there a distinction between saying, hey, this key changed just do the thing and call the API and updating the state with the stuff that is that we know to have changed because we just made that API call. Yes. So the use mutation hook, you, I think others, there's an on, on success or something that you can use, and then you can have a handle on the, react, the, the query cache, and then, yeah, you can edit data in the, in the cache. Um, you can also, like, if you have some initial data, you can preload the cache with some data, and then it won't make that first request. Um, because you're you're providing it, um, you can also, you know, separate of any hook, you can just call it preload query, and then you can have it fetch that data. So if you nice. want to to fire off a, a fetch for a query as your app is loading, but before maybe a, a later JavaScript chunk is loaded, you can kind of prefetch stuff and move it up a little bit. All right, pretty snazzy. <laughs> I can dig it. I haven't worked with any of that, but I I know it's possible from reading the docs. So. Yeah, I mean, that's been a, a big deal on some recent apps I've worked on. Um, and it's been especially interesting, too. I know I know this isn't a GraphQL library by any means, but... But you can do anything with it. Exactly. I think you can actually use React Query with GraphQL if you wanted to. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And same, SWR is the same way. But, like, it's not, it's not a GraphQL client built in, for example. But it has, it takes all the good parts, um, or shall we say, all of the... Um, protocol agnostic kind of parts out right right um of of say apollo client or something similar like that and i i like that and a i lot. think like react query is like like 20 percent the size of apollo client or something it's way oh, yeah. smaller than apollo client well so. right it doesn't it doesn't have to it's missing the ql or no <laughs> it's just the q no g or l there we go <laughs> figured it out yeah open gl that's a whole other thing um <laughs> oh had to sneak a 3d joke in there Always got to do it. No, I'm, I'm super excited to try this out. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm excited to try to do more with it and see what can come up. Uh, unfortunately for me in my work, or you know, I mean, uh, not necessarily unfortunately, but trade-offs, it's in analytics. So most things are just reading data, yeah. which, you know, provides us certain things for caching that are beneficial. But the like complex uh, invalidation between making changes and reading them isn't, aren't as many opportunities for that. But you certainly have a few. What if you started introducing uh, ways to change the analytics data, though? Like a big reset button. Clear out all your data. Just make yeah. it make it well, great. So in, in everything, you know, when they when the <laughs> when you get your uh, local storage back to version, you just wipe local storage, and you're good to go. There we go. Yep. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. You you could have a stonks button that just makes all the stonks go up into the right. <laughs> everything costs less than expected. Whoa! Every everything was delivered on time, 
And, yeah, early um, even, early even before or before requested. You don't want to. That's that's a that's an issue if if it's delivered before the receiving end is ready for it. Oftentimes, you know, there are windows of like thirty minutes or an hour or two, so it has to be within the window. But but you know, for f- the last mile of small parcel delivery, you know, delivering early is probably fine. Good so, point. Good point. But that's not that's not the time scale you're working on. Can you tell I work for a logistics company? <laughs> yeah, ma- yeah, you're you're doing mass mass logistics right there. All of the logistics. I'm 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 on logistics level zero, and you're up there at ninety nine. Pretty great. Yeah, I'm not that high up there. Anyway, um, yeah. So React Query, I think we we like it, and it'll be exciting seeing it in the future. Yep. And now for something completely different. Twitter. Brandon talks about Flutter. Oh, Twitter. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> maybe next. Maybe next. Next time. time. Next time. So I, another I, three yeah, months. I got enough of my. I got enough of my data fetching. Talk in on this one. There's no need to talk about what it's like on. Oh, Dart. so you're gonna make Flutter query next? Okay. Oh yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. It's funny you mentioned that. I might have enough to actually work on a Dart library. Not that anyone would want it, <laughs> but maybe somebody would. Um, but then I'd have to write Dart and publish Dart and associate Dart with my name. Oof. That's scary. Gotta use the pseudonym of Bread underscore MN. There you bread, go. Br- bread, bread on Johnson. Um, well, yeah, as as Brian said, it's probably just about time for a new Twitter followees. And um, uh, not for lack of trying, uh, I did not uh, I did not follow anybody. Uh, since the last one no i just didn't fill out the section <laughs> and i i don't that's because it would have caused an overflow yeah i've, I've probably followed about 200 people since uh, our last episode so uh, it's probably just best to leave it blank uh, at this point um that's my that's my um penance for uh having followed so many or any of the people you followed people you had previously unfollowed in your mass unfollowing absolutely probably a significant portion of them Right. I mean, like at this point, I mean, you know, it's like it's not like there's people I don't know. Well, OK, that, you know, I there are people I don't know. But, you know, a lot of times when somebody tweet shows up my feed, I realize, like, oh, I unfollowed you for some reason. That's unfortunate. And so I add them back in and everything's fine. I mean, it's just the world returning to its natural order. Yeah. Well, I just unfollowed a person. So that's we got to <gasps> try it a little bit. It happens. A little tiny bit. Anyway, I put six people here because I couldn't I couldn't decide. You so, covered for me. You covered Yeah, there we go. I got you. So uh, I'll try to go th- get through these quick here. The first is Alexis Gay. Uh, she is a comedy person and biz ops and creator partnerships at Patreon uh, to read from her Twitter. Um, I saw a couple of her videos show up and in my feed. Um, so just some good 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 comedy, some some tech stuff, but not 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 all of it at all. So yeah, that's been a good account to follow. Uh, let's see. Next up is Ian Sutherland, who um, is a, I followed for being a maintainer of great react app. Um, that's a tool I use. So I'd like to see some thoughts about it. So he's also a Node.js contributor and um, other developer, you know, JavaScript node stuff like, like that in my feed. Um, next up is, uh, Una Kravitz, uh, Brandon, I think I first heard about her through a recommendation from you years ago about the, uh, tools day tools podcast, day. Yep. which I still listen to. And, uh, Una is one of the hosts of that, uh, finally wanted more CSS in my Twitter feed. So I gave her a follow. Uh, she is a developer relations, uh, person at, uh, Google, I think in the Chrome team now. So, uh, Yeah. Lots of great content there. Oh, I totally. Sorry, I totally. I I uh, in my mental model, uh, she worked at IBM, which might not be true or might be very very old. I think old. I think okay. her and the other guy who does that podcast uh, met at Netflix or IBM, like yeah, three UI three, four designer years ago, at so. IBM in the past. And DigitalOcean. Yeah. Yep. Oh, that's that's. That's good people right there. Yeah, they're all good moving around. Uh, next is uh, Monica, uh, who uh, I believe is speaking at React Rally. But uh, Monica recently had uh, an example of the new GitHub 
uh, profile kind of description, the readme, the readme, fancy readme file featured on GitHub's example page. And so that's been pretty cool to see as well. So she has a lot of great stuff in her feed. Uh, next up is Rasmus Anderson, uh, who is a design at Figma. Why, yes, he is. I followed because he wrote the inter font, which I added to my website. And I like to follow people who built core things that I use in my website. So I, I followed him because he built the font that I use. Uh, I followed him for that, then realized that he was like design at Figma and that kind of stuff. So, you know, I was finding out about people for the wrong reasons, but... And then finally, I don't remember her real name. Um, on Twitter, it's at Sailor Ghoul. Ghoul? Ghoul? I don't know how you pronounce that. G-H-O-U-L. Uh, that's the display name. But um, she's the host of the Get Cute podcast, which I've been listening to for a year a year now. Nice. Um, yeah, it's been fun hearing about her story. Um, yeah, she's featured on the Ladybug podcast a month or two ago as well. So, Yeah. That's me. Lots of lots of tech this time. A little bit of comedy. So nice. What about you, Ryan? I I I had thought I didn't follow anybody, but I might maybe did. I don't know. It's been two months. <laughs> um, the first one here is Brad Corns or something. I don't know. Uh, names are weird. Did you know that? And so this guy is one of the new engineers at the new Tailwind Labs, which is sort of the umbrella org that will do Tailwind stuff now, I guess. And I believe he is responsible for working on the, in, um, in like IntelliSense, you know, extra extension for, uh, VS Code, which is pretty cool. So it makes all of the Tailwind's classes just appear out of nowhere whenever you try to, you know, complete in a class or class name prop which is always great there's a there's a first party one of those now i feel like i've only ever been using the third party one uh i think i was using the third party one and it became the first party one. Oh, okay well there you go there you have it yeah lots of parties so if you have the if you have tailwinds in your code and you have this code you should use the thing hmm uh, Sounds about right and then the other person is ranjan uh and he is uh, one of the co-authors, along with Can, uh, who works on the Margins newsletter, uh, also just website because you could just read it online like a normal person, and um, together they're pretty cool. And um, I hadn't really been following him so much; I'd been following Can for many years, and so it's kind of cool to see the other side of the newsletter. And that's it for me. Cool. Well, uh, what do you guys have going on until uh, till next time? Uh, it's, um, summer still, so, you know, one, one to two months, <laughs> <laughs> summer still, it might still be summer by the time we do this again. Um, it'll definitely still be March though. Yeah, it'll still be March. I mean, hopefully it'll be more fall like by the next time we do this. So I don't know. Yeah. That sounds more like March than the heat we've been getting here in July. Very Except true. today when it's like 67 out right now. It was amazing. Right? Oh, I love it. For my part, uh. I'm going to be uh, kicking off a couple more new projects in August, which is kind of cool. Um, you know, I had uh, some stuff uh, I, I kind of wound down at the end of last month, um, which was, uh, you know, in, in, in some cases really positive and in other cases, you know, nobody, nobody likes to shut things down due to COVID. Um, so that's a little bit more of a bummer, but um August is looking pretty, uh, pretty, pretty busy and pretty exciting. Lots of, lots of new stuff, lots of flutter, a little bit of svelte here and there. Um, Mm -hmm. and, uh, of course, uh, react through and through. Um, but yeah, back, back, back in the code signing minds, uh, with a couple more mobile apps. So that's, what's new with me. Uh, let's see for me. I will be attending the now virtual react rally conference in, uh, what day is it? It's on August 14th. So I will be attending that. Um, looking forward to that. Uh, not quite sure what that means, but I'll be, I'll be there. Uh, I signed into the react rally Slack for the first time in almost a year. So that was fun. Didn't, I literally missed one message in May. <laughs> Otherwise it's been dead but it's, as you would expect for a conference Slack. But before that, the Monday through Thursday of that week, I have my first PTO since, uh, the end of January when I came back from my trip to Vietnam. So I am 
very much looking forward to having some time off from work for the first time in there we go over six months so yeah that'll be that'll be nice i have no idea what i'm doing if it's going to be a heat wave like uh the high of the high here in the twin cities next sunday so a week from today is 97 so if that week is super hot like it could be uh i might just defer the pto till it's a little cooler and end up working that week anyway just so i can spend my pto being outside and not you know dying in the process that's a good choice yeah i i plan on sleeping and biking and maybe reading outside like i plan on doing a lot more than i ever really do <laughs> so so you can do all all three of those if you use an audiobook S- sleeping too yeah sure <laughs> i'll get a lot out of that book <laughs> there we go <laughs> that was a tie-in to our exciting fringe episode which everybody should listen to it's about the same way i watched dark uh, so I feel yeah like what i should have said for next time the last episode was I'm, I'm gonna watch dark so i did watch dark and i cannot recommend it enough you should all watch Very it true. watch it when in german with english subtitles it is so good uh if you want to talk about it tweet tweet me send me a message on twitter fi- find me somehow i would love to chat um yeah there's a small conversation in the fringe I shouldn't have spoilers, but uh, so if you want to check that out, go for it. It is it is really quite good. It is really quite good. Otherwise, where uh, where can we find you all? You can find me all sorts of places, but mostly in in, in Minneapolis. Um, on the internet, I'm Brandon underscore I'm in, um, mostly on Twitter and Instagram, where I post pictures of, for example, croissants, which I made this weekend because they're really good, or c- crescent rolls. Croissant. They looked delicious and amazing. So props to that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's like it's like LaCroix, right? La, La Croissant rolls. Um, they're they're really good. It's the first time I made pastry like that from from uh gosh darn scratch. So it's pretty neat. So just follow me to stay tuned on all that stuff. And I occasionally post about software too. Mostly croissants though. How about you, Brian? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Brian Mitch L. Um, I do have an Instagram with that same handle, though I really kind of neglect it. Um, but I'm there. I'm I'm always there watching people's stories and looking at posts. Um, my website, brianm.me, where I believe last episode I said I was going to post a post within a week or sometime. But I ended up – I did post that post, but it was July 6th uh, called Sneaky CSS Concepts and Features I Never Knew. Uh, It covers some kind of core concepts to CSS and some examples that are like honestly pretty shoddy, but I tried Um, some links to stuff. It's more just like kind of um, if you're new to CSS or or whatever, you want to learn something, um, it at least discusses some concepts that might be good to know. And then you can go read about on MDN, which is a way better site than mine to read about this kind of stuff. So yeah. What about you, Ryan? Well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on Twitter at Ryan Amar, and of course on my website that I have not yet updated for the month of July. That is RyanRampersad.com. Don't go yet. Go later in August so I can update it for July, and maybe even August at the same time. I should also plug, uh, my site has a fun mode now, so there's a button in the header. You can click and it'll just, <laughs> it'll be fun. And there's no way to stop fun mode except by reloading the page. <laughs> uh, that's the way to do it. I don't know if that's a, fe- is that a feature I should add? I don't know. Maybe... No, don't add it. It should it's respect hilarious. the prefers reduced motion media query, but um, so what? The parrots just go a little bit. Grayscale uh, parrots. Grayscale parrots. I think it just doesn't do parrots. I don't remember. That's not reduced color. It's reduced yeah. motion. Oh, I think actually, what do I? Uh, I should. I gotta look at the code. I I do a little detection for like um, Internet Explorer or certain browsers. So it's it's using oh, ES favorite. modules with a dynamic import directly on Polyfilled. So it fails on many environments. Like I think non Chrome Edge, it doesn't load, but it tries to, but then fails because they support ES modules, but they don't support dynamic import. But if you go on it in like IE eleven, it shows a thing like legacy browsers can't have fun or something like that. Terrifying. Those poor browsers. <laughs> They're doing their best. That's amazing. I mean, IE11 isn't. IE11 is doing its worst, so let's be clear. Right. So um, I can, I'm checking now. So if you have reduced motion turned on, it throws an alert saying, sorry, you, you have set preferred, or you have set to prefer reduced motion. Fun mode is based on motion and color shifting. So 
Sorry, it's not. I'm 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 saying that my site or fun mode isn't fun if you per, if you need preferred reduced motion, but it's it's really just a like visual seizure and party parts. So it's probably good. I like how you can pump out the confetti indefinitely, and it's just it's fine with it. Just keep going. Yeah, uh, certain browsers I've seen Firefox lag like crazy loading it, but you know do you can. I built it on while I yeah developed it running Safari, and it worked great there. So and Ryan. Ryan requested that the console have fun as well. So there's a little bit of fun mode in there. I've never used font family fantasy, but now I have. <laughs> it's amazing. What? It, I think it's papyrus font on Mac OS. I don't know what it is on windows. I, I but can tell you what it is on windows. I don't either. It is, uh, Arial. It is Arial. <laughs> Generic. Oh, gross. That's their fantasy font. Wow. No wonder people hate Windows. It's so boring. <laughs> yeah, I'll, sh- I'll show you a screenshot of what it looks like. It's not all that fun. Yeah, so that, that was that was fun to build. Sometimes you just have to have some fun building vanilla JavaScript. Now, it is being run through Rollup for... Uh, I did at least do minification. And uh, do I do anything else to it? I don't think so. I think I just run it through Terser. Yeah, it's fun. I don't want to load Babel. For something like this, I'm, I'm not used to your full page reloads. I haven't been to a website that had a full page reload in ten years. Yeah, so that's the other thing. I figured with fun mode, since because it's built on Jekyll and it's a static site, like going to any page would have stopped anyway. So might as well just have it go forever. And or, well, I know, but you, you should know, really carry it over. Reload. So you got to interrogate local storage. Yep, got to be away. We just need people. People just need to use Remix Run, which um, is built around. You know the classic understanding of a new page is a new location is a new file so things are not preserved quite as much despite the fact that it is a single-ish page app turbo links all day long yes yeah did anything ever happen with that remix uh, I, I, I don't know i'm pretty I sure haven't... it just fell out of my feed and i'm okay with that ryan or michael yeah, were on okay. i think uh react podcast a couple weeks ago oh. that was a good episode interesting there you go you can find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash pk59. Uh, you can discuss the episode on our subreddit, which is reddit.com slash r slash thenexustv. You can also find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash thenexustv uh, or tweet at any one of us. Um, we also have a Patreon, which is patreon.com slash thenexustv. If you like what we're doing, head on over there. Uh, otherwise, we will... Uh, be in your ears again in another month or two probably have a good one have a good one have a good one the nexus the nexus the nexus tv podcasts from from the the technological technological convergence. convergence